all for being here. I have quite a bit of material I'm excited to get through. Um, I've asked for a timing notice if I'm running out of time at the end, and um, we'll talk even more quickly than I otherwise am prone to do. What I want to do is take you on a bit of a journey of um, research over a 20-year period and how it took me to a, a somewhat new direction in the last couple of years, focusing on what we call institutional betrayal. The research that I'll be describing is highly collaborative. Um, I'm very pleased that some of my students, who can raise their hand right now, are sitting here, and they have contributed greatly um, to this research effort. Um, there, in addition to current students, are numerous former students and other colleagues who have helped me think about these issues and certainly um, conduct the empirical work that I'll be drawing from today. I'll be talking about three related concepts, betrayal trauma, betrayal blindness, and institutional betrayal. And I'll be drawing from a new book um, that was mentioned, Blind to Betrayal, that I wrote with my colleague and friend, Pamela Burrell. I want to take you back 20 years, actually 22 years, um, to the case of Frank Fitzpatrick and um, Father Porter. This was a, an article from 1992 in the New York Times, and it was one of the cases that really set me on a journey of trying to understand aspects of responding to interpersonal trauma. Frank Fitzpatrick began remembering having been sexually molested by a parish priest at age 12. Mr. Fitzpatrick's retrieval of the repressed memories began, he said, when I was feeling a great mental pain. Mr. Fitzpatrick slowly realized that the mental pain was due to a betrayal of some kind and remembered the sound of heavy breathing. Then I realized I'd been sexually abused by someone I love, said Mr. Fitzpatrick. But it was not until two weeks later that he suddenly remembered the priest, the Reverend James R. Porter. This particular case was unusual in a number of ways. One was that um, Father Porter was actually eventually subjected to a criminal trial and found guilty of sexual abuse. Um, and he confessed to the sexual abuse. Dozens and dozens of victims came forward, most of whom reported that they had never forgotten the abuse that had, for most of them, occurred 30 years prior to this criminal trial. Fitzpatrick did forget, and when he remembered, it produced enough of a crisis that he had to do something about it. He hadn't been living with it consciously, and um, he was a trained investigator, and he was able to actually get an investigation going that eventually law enforcement picked up on. A question for a psychologist in a situation like that was why and how would individuals remain unaware or forget traumas or betrayals they had experienced? And in attempting to answer that question, I began to work on what I've come to call betrayal trauma theory. Um, of course, as you probably know, there was also another question that popped up at the time, which was, were these memories necessarily true or false? Um, I'm not going to talk about that now. If there's time in the question period, we can talk about that. Um, but I'm going to focus on cases like Fitzpatrick's, very well corroborated cases, and say how and why would this occur. And I'm going to focus particularly today on why. Um, and ask you to think about two things about our experience in the world and what it is to be human. One of those things is our sensitivity to betrayal. It's been argued that some ability to evaluate the trustworthiness of others is so important that we've actually um, evolved specific mechanisms to detect cheating and betrayal. Why might that be? Because we are such a social species and we make so many deals and contracts with one another, whether implicit or explicit, that to not attend to cheating and betrayal would set us up for very bad outcome. In particular, we make repeated arrangements and uh, deals and contracts with the same people, and we better notice if we're being cheated, so we can either um, require that the situation be remedied, Often, that's a fight kind of response. Or, withdraw from this person who is not trustworthy and protect ourselves from further betrayal. 
And if you think about many situations in life where you've encountered somebody betraying you, whether it's a store giving you a bad product, or a partner who's being unfaithful, or the myriad other ways people can betray you, you might remember taking one of those actions, fighting or fleeing, confronting or withdrawing. You might also remember the strong feelings. These are hot cognitions when we realize we've been cheated or betrayed. And they're good for us in the sense they protect us. All of this is when we are empowered. Hold that in place for a minute and think about something else about us, which is that we often are tremendously dependent on somebody who has more resources or more power than us. This is necessarily true in infancy and childhood when we are utterly dependent on caregivers. We can't survive for five minutes as an infant in the world without being cared for because we'd be vulnerable to being consumed by a predator or otherwise harmed. This continues to some degree throughout the lifespan, certainly to a great degree in childhood, to a greater or lesser degrees throughout the lifespan depending on our resources and our state of health, and so on, but none of us can escape dependency. Dependency in humans is very extreme because we're born essentially physically <coughs> immature, um, but we also come well armed with an attachment system. This is definitely an evolved system. We can see it in other animals and other primates. Humans have a very well developed attachment system. The attachment system works in both the infant and dependent person and in the caregiver. So you see this happening right here. We've got a, a reciprocal relationship in the sense that both the caregiver and the um, infant are giving each other reinforcement for this relationship. The infant's probably making very adorable little cooing sounds, and the infant has to do that because this is an extremely resource expensive relationship for the caregiver. The caregiver needs this reinforcement to keep putting all these resources into this relationship. And if you've ever had to um, witness an infant unable to behave in these reinforcing ways, you will know that infant is really in a, in a um, dangerous situation in life. The way we experience attachment is very simple. It's the emotion of love. Love propels us to do things that make us lovable. It propels approach, and it's, and it's positive approach. It's not confrontation, and it's not withdrawal. Now, of course, if you are a mature person in a relationship that's very safe, you can afford to confront and, and um, do things that might not be entirely sort of adorable. But if you're in a relationship in which you are not totally safe, and you start to engage in confrontation or withdrawal, you might put yourself into an extremely dangerous situation. So imagine that baby detecting some mistreatment and trying to respond in the way an empowered person would. That baby's probably risking his or her life because the caregiver might withdraw and fail to provide necessary nurturance. And it is this dilemma that betrayal trauma theory um, focuses on and proposes is solved by betrayal blindness. How does betrayal blindness work? Betrayal blindness works by disrupting cognitive mechanisms of awareness, whether they be awareness at the time an event is unfolding, later understanding of what happened and therefore some sort of memory and ambition. It's breaking down the awareness so that the dependent person who is being mistreated can continue to engage in this relationship. Another way to say this is that attachment trumps betrayal detection when the survival demands are uh, meet, meet this circumstance. That's the theory. And it really leads to a different way of looking at trauma than was historically the case. In the, in the mainstream sort of traumatic stress that evolved primarily through work with combat veterans and, um, and accident victims. The emphasis was for a long time on the terrifying, um, life-threatening elements of traumatic experience that may lead to disruptions of anxiety and arousal through excessive fear. Social betrayal is an independent and orthogonal dimension to life threat that has to do with this betrayal from either the perpetrator of a crime or uh, the 
response of society in the aftermath of a traumatic event. Um, we certainly saw after Hurricane Katrina, um, people describing experiences of betrayal and how the society around this natural disaster occurred. The important point from this graph is to understand these dimensions of challenging situations, what we might call traumas, are distinct and can be combined in any number of ways. And for the last 20 years or so, my students and I have been asking the question, if we try to do a dimensional breakdown of trauma, what will we see in terms of people's responses to traumatic experiences? Our very first interest had to do with, uh, surprisingly, memory, because that was what was inspiring this way of thinking. And we made a memory prediction that betrayal trauma would predict more forgetting and unawareness than non-betrayal trauma. And more specifically, childhood abuse perpetrated by a caregiver will lead to more memory impairment than will abuse perpetrated by a non-caregiver. There have been quite a few studies that have looked at this. Most of the studies have similar results, not all. Um, there's been a fair amount of controversy. Um, but here's the results from um, one of the studies where we collected the data in my laboratory. We looked at um, physical, emotional, and sexual abuse and um, asked the question, if this occurred, who was the perpetrator in relationship to the victim, and then derived a scale of memory impairment here referring to sexually um, forgetting um, with an absolute theoretical maximum of 1.0 that would be not remembering right now. Um, which people can report that they were, they were told something happened that they don't remember, to zero, have always remembered it in great detail, very easily. And you'll see that caretaker abuse is leading to higher rates of memory impairment than non-caretaker. This is statistically significant for sexual and emotional abuse. This is not an experiment. This is trying to measure life as it unfolds. There are many covariant factors um, to that. Um, we controlled for statistically because they seem candidates to account for some of this were duration and of the abuse and age of onset. They did not make this effect go away. Um, there have been other data sets where we've seen this effect as well. Um, this led us to then ask the question, okay, memory is related to betrayal, but what else might be? How else might people sort of respond to this dilemma situation? And we thought maybe we'd see more avoidance and withdrawal in betrayal cases. So we set out on an um, exploration of how betrayal as a dimension of trauma relates to outcome. And we, were, we really had some surprising results. We expected to see a few cases where betrayal was accounting for outcome. But what we have seen over and over is actually that betrayal is accounting for an awful lot of post-traumatic distress. In the sense that we are trying to hold constant and control for exposure to traumas that are low in betrayal and thus how much extra does betrayal add to this response. Um, for example, um, we did a st two studies that were very similar in structure, so I'll present them together with very different populations. We had 185 college students in one study. We had 99 adult community members with health and pain problems. In both cases, these samples were recruited without any mention of trauma. And this is important when thinking about research and trauma and the question of generalizability. You really have to ask who your samples are and how you're recruiting them. In the case of the college students, we run our human subject pool in a way that allows us to recruit without saying what the topic of the study is until um, the participants are there to do it. Um, and um, the adult community members were recruited on the basis of having health problems, 12 months at least of a, of a health problem. And in both cases, we measured many things, including trauma history, as well as various kinds of um, symptom outcome. And if you look at the college students, what you'll see is that exposure to traumas with high betrayal was significantly correlated with a number of negative outcomes, including physical health problems, anxiety, depression, and dissociation. Um, we expected depression and dissociation. We were surprised initially when we started to see how much anxiety is associated with um, trauma. I've come to understand anxiety in a new light due to this. I think there's an awful lot of existential anxiety when the person you depend on is not dependable. Um, but it was not, it was initially a surprise. Um, 
because trauma is correlated with trauma, it's always necessary in studies like this to control statistically for trauma exposure. People who are once traumatized are at higher risk for additional trauma for a number of different reasons. Um, so low betrayal exposure and high betrayal exposure are themselves correlated. So we need to use multiple regression to tease apart contributions, and we find that high betrayal is accounting for and driving almost all of the relationship we're observing here. We have the same pattern of results, but much higher correlations with our community sample of chronically ill people. Probably because these are extremely traumatized adults um, who have numerous symptoms that they're dealing with, so we've got more um, range in this Example. Again, though, exposure to trauma with high betrayal is driving the relationship between these negative outcomes and trauma exposure. These are whopping correlations. We're picking up whopping correlations here. And we've seen this over and over again in our laboratory, that exposure to these high betrayal traumas is quite toxic for people. In a, jumping ahead um, to um, a more recent study, and there have been many in between, I don't have time to tell you about them all, but um, in a more recent study with Jennifer Gomez, who is sitting right over there, um, we looked at some symptoms we hadn't previously looked at, suicide, non-suicidal self-injury, and hallucin hallucinations, and how they might relate to betrayal trauma. In this case, we restricted our investigation to childhood sexual abuse, but we compared high and low childhood sexual abuse, and we see that um, not having childhood sexual abuse at all is um, the uh, leads to the lowest um, rates of these um, self-injury behaviors. Um, betrayal trauma by a um, se child sexual abuse by somebody not close to the victim um, leads to a certain level, but what really sends things spiraling is betrayal is child sexual abuse by somebody who the victim is very close to. We see the sim a similar pattern with hallucinations. We also know from other research with Melissa Platt that shame is related to betrayal trauma. And an interesting thing to think about is, are these just symptoms of toxicity, or are these some of these um, outcomes playing a role somewhat like forgetting? Are these actually, in some sense, functional for the survivor of these, of these crimes? Um, and it would, might work like this. Shame is a way to potentially protect the perpetrator from blame and to encourage a kind of appeasing behavior rather than confrontation or withdrawal. Hallucinations may be a way to um, make sense of a confusing reality, again, without putting blame on a perpetrator that could be a dangerous kind of blame to have. This, this is you know, for future research to find out if they have playing these mechanistic roles. Maternal re-victimization is also related to, um, and childhood, um, continuing childhood abuse is also related to betrayal trauma. We see here that um, re-victimized mothers are more likely to have children who become victimized in betrayal trauma, presumably due to betrayal blindness that makes it hard to detect dangers for the child suggesting that betrayal begets betrayal. We um, have also discovered that even mundane betrayals and how one responds to them are associated with exposure to childhood betrayal trauma. Um, a study that we completed with undergraduates asking about events that would not be considered traumatic by most diagnostic, diagnostic schemes um, but are disturbing betrayals for people, such as infidelity and, and other sort of dating violations, that these um, events were more likely to occur to people who had childhood betrayal trauma, but more important, when they did occur, they were associated with more unawareness at the time and more willingness to stay in the relationship in which this betrayal had occurred. This is what we would expect um, would be a potential lasting impact of betrayal blindness. The good news is this gives us ideas for intervention because if we can break down betrayal blindness in a good way, we might help people be more empowered to protect themselves from future betrayal. The summary of our findings over 20 years is 
over and over that betrayal seems to be toxic to individuals. We have found significant relationships with a host of negative outcomes, including those listed here, depression, anxiety, dissociation, shame, PTSD, physical illness, borderline personality disorder features, hallucination, self-harm, and re-victimization. And although the, um, a lot of this research stems from the labs of myself and my um, students, there are now independent laboratories who have contributed to this, lab this uh, literature as well. Another thing we've looked at in our research and somewhat been surprised by is the relationship between betrayal trauma and gender. Now we know that there are gender effects in all sorts of domains, including in the diagnosis of various mental health disorders. Um, and among those, depression, anxiety, and dissociation are more likely to be diagnosed in female than male populations. And it raises the question whether gender is playing some role here in those diagnosis rates by um, perhaps acting on exposure risk. In one of the studies that collected data that allowed us to look at gender, Lou Goldberg and I asked 750 homeowners about their trauma experiences using a survey instrument that we developed called the Brief Betrayal Trauma Survey. And I should say, in all this research, we avoid words like abuse and rape and trauma and try to describe events behaviorally and ask people if they had experienced particular kinds of events. This uh, measurement was designed to discriminate between traumatic experiences, low, medium, and high betrayal. And what we found, looking at gender, was that overall men and women were reporting roughly the equivalent levels of trauma exposure, but they were showing very different patterns uh, for specific kinds of traumatic events. Um, so uh, one way you can look at the data is in terms of we have 12 different kinds of trauma, we were looking at assessed childhood and adult exposure, and for each event we can ask, was there a significant gender difference? Wherever you see a bunch of asterisks and bold, these were highly significant gender differences between male and female reports. But we also um, are showing in this graph um, the direction of the gender difference. So the more turquoise color is where we're getting higher rates of male exposure, and the more violet color is where we're getting higher rates of female exposure. Of the 24 possible comparisons, 12 were very, very significant, um, which surprised us. And how to make sense of this? Well, usually people have traditionally divided into sort of physical abuse and emotional abuse and things like that. If we look at it that way, we found, as other researchers have, that males experience more traumatic accidents. And Females are reporting more childhood and adulthood sexual abuse. For physical abuse, it depends on age, where males are reporting more childhood and females are reporting more in adulthood. What to make of that? Let's look at it in terms of, gen of uh, betrayal instead. If we look at it in terms of betrayal, a pattern emerges. Here we're looking at high, medium, and low betrayal items categorized by whether we have a significant gender effect, and you'll see that when there's a significant gender effect for high betrayal, it's always in the direction of females reporting more. And when there's a significant effect for low betrayal, it's always in the direction of males reporting more. And so mix for medium. Um, another way to ask the question is, what's the probability that these community members, who by the age were kind of, by the way, were kind of on average middle age, but they range from 20 to 80, um, but they've had a lot of time to um, get exposed to trauma. So you can ask, what's the probability they've had at least one high betrayal trauma, at least one medium, or at least one low? And you'll see there that the 52% of our women had at least one high, 29% um, of the men, but exactly the opposite direction for um, low betrayal. This is the same results shown graphically as a very strong effect size. And while we expected some gender difference, we didn't expect the magnitude of this gender difference. We've seen this in study after study. Um, and it's interesting to go back to the physical abuse case because it seemed like there was some difference between adulthood and childhood, and what's that about? 
There is some, but what is the same for both adult and childhood physical abuse is we see the same crossover interaction. That is, boys are getting more attacked by someone not close to them, girls more by someone close, um, and the same thing in adulthood. Is this just North American samples? We can't entirely answer that question as well as would be ideal. We have some, a sample from Japan and we have a sample from the island of Kauai, which is ethnically very different than North America. Um, Caucasians are in the minority. The majority population is Japanese American, um, but there are also native Hawaiians and a lot of other ethnicities represented. And so we can at least say, what do we see in this really different population? Um, and what we find here are two effects. One, we see the same gender effect over and over in this population, but we also see a whopping um, social status effect that impacts high and low betrayal trauma in the same way. So basically, lower social status leads to more trauma, and that's not too surprising. But that gender difference is showing up in just the same way within that females get more high betrayal and males get more low betrayal. Um, and in this population, high betrayal, like in our other studies, predicts depression and dissociation. We have begun to explore the question, can this account for some of the difference that in diagnosis rates? Um, and we have um, some indication that it is accounting for at least a piece of that variance. Gender is a very complicated, issue and, and it's not going to account for all of it, um, but much more research needs to be done before we can be definitive about that. So um, a summary of 20 years of research now is in both that there are these toxic effects and there seems to be a pronounced difference in exposure risk for males and females. So I'm going to switch now to betrayal blindness and um, and bridge to some of the work we're doing now on institutional betrayal. Betrayal blindness is the unawareness, not knowing and forgetting exhibited by people towards betrayal. So it's just a broader concept than forgetting. Betrayal blindness can occur by not perceiving the betrayal right at the moment it's occurring, as well as forgetting something that was perceived at some point. And we believe that um, victims, perpetrators, and witnesses all may have times when betrayal blindness is useful to them for their own survival and self-protection. The concept of institutional betrayal is extending the idea of one-on-one -on -one betrayal to institutional contexts in which you could think of the institution as, as like sometimes the perpetrator of an interpersonal victimization. Um, institutions, like uh, other specific people we're dependent on, often play a role in our life that's, in which we are highly dependent on those institutions. And to the extent that we are dependent on an institution, we would expect to see betrayal blindness to the institution if by confronting or withdrawing from that institution, one's putting oneself at significant risk. So, for instance, if you have an employer who is mistreating you and you feel, correctly or incorrectly, but if you perceive the need for a job with that employer as pretty essential to your ability to function, you would have an implicit and inherent motivation to not see that mistreatment in order to protect your relationship with that employer. Same thing for the government or the church you're in or the school you're in if you are in a dependent relationship with your school, which many people are. Um, so we um, have been very interested in trying to understand whether the betrayal trauma theory um, <coughs> operates in some similar ways in this institutional context. Um, we've looked at um, a number of different kinds of institutional betrayal and considered them. We have a lot of ongoing work right now um, this is relatively new work within the last five years in my laboratory, but I think it's been teaching us a lot. Um, there, one of the things that we've been 
thinking about, in terms of institutional betrayal, is it has underlying dimensions too, because institutions are big, complicated things, and institutions can both have explicit policies and behaviors that are ingrained in the institution that are themselves inherently betrayals of the people within the institution, such as a government that um, decides to start committing genocide and killing some of its own citizens, or the institutions can have behaviors that are um, implicit, but maybe not stated down in policy. They can have um, behaviors that are acts of commission and acts of omission. And all of these can constitute institutional betrayal. So we've been interested in particular of the, the behavior of institutions when they fail to take action when there is a wrongdoing in the context of that institution and how that can be a powerful kind of betrayal for people. Um, and we've really focused specifically on educational institutions, but I want to tell you that to some extent we um, would, um, went this direction because it was a practical direction for us to go. Um, four or five years ago, um, I guess it's five now, Carly Smith, who's also sitting right here, um, came to my laboratory and um, wanted to do a study on institutional betrayal and she had a great idea which was military sexual trauma. Go back five years in your mind that were reports just starting to come out. We were hearing about people getting raped in the military and having their cases be handled in horrible ways and people were starting to say that the way their cases were being handled was harmful, maybe even more harmful than the event itself. And so Carly um, and I wanted to look at military sexual trauma. We quickly discovered that it's not so easy to get a military sample. And um, we uh, wanted this research to be done in here for program requirements for a first year project. So we thought, well, you know, maybe something like this occurs in colleges too. I've been a university professor for well then, at that point, um, somewhere between 20 and 25 years, and I've heard many students tell me that they were sexually assaulted, they took it to the university in some capacity, and bad things happened. I've heard that at an anecdotal level, but I had no idea of the scope of that problem. I, I didn't know. I'd heard it over the years from individual students. Um, I knew the rates of sexual assault on college campuses were high because we've got a lot of research and have had for quite a number of decades. But the question was, were the institutions contributing to the harm of sexual assault occurring on college campuses? And you can laugh at the question now because we all know the answer now because it's become a national topic. But when we designed this study, we didn't know. And we thought, well, maybe we'll pick something up. We did a very simple study. We measured sexual experiences that were um, involved both positive and coercive. We measured trauma symptoms, and we created a new scale to measure institutional betrayal um, that we call the Institutional Betrayal Questionnaire. This is continuing to evolve and be under development, but the version we used is posted on my website so you can see exactly what we asked people. Um, and we wondered um, in our scale if we could pick up kinds of behaviors that might constitute institutional betrayal, such as creating an environment in which this type of uh, experience of sexual assault seemed common or like no big deal, making it difficult to report the experience, covering up the experience, and punishing the survivor in some way for this experience. Um, these were all things being reported for military sexual trauma. So first of all, we, like many researchers before us and since this, have found that we have high rates of sexual assault on um, college campuses. Um, there are various ways one can break this down. Um, we had, um, 36% of our sample reporting, this is a female sample in this analysis, um, reporting um, no bad sexual experience. Um, we had various degrees of unwanted sexual experience, including high rates of um, very definitely illegal sorts of behaviors such as, or experiences such as um, forcible penetrative sexual assault and um, sexual um, assault through intoxication on the part of the victim. That wasn't new, just sort of replicating what's been found. We also found trauma symptoms were related to sexual assault, so the more sexual assault, the more symptomatic 
again, not new. What was new was that 40% of those reporting sexual assault did also indicate some institutional betrayal. And, importantly, that trauma symptoms were related to institutional betrayal. And I think that the really important way to understand this is as an exacerbative effect, because what you see here for the case of anxiety and we have similar patterns for other negative outcomes is that if you have more sexual assault, that's bad. But if you add to it institutional betrayal, it is that much worse for people. And this was a new finding. Um, it happened to get published in 2013 after Penn State and a lot of national attention had um, started to um, be focused on the problem of sexual assault on college campuses. Um, while this research was going through the publication pipeline, we were busy doing additional studies. And I'll tell you about just a couple of them. There's a clock in this room, so I'm just going to check. Okay. Um, so, um, one of the studies that we did that's now under review um, looked at the same sorts of effects, but asking the question, did the students um, identify as heterosexual or um, some non-heterosexual category? And we found um, in this research a similar pattern, but um, being non-heterosexual was associated with higher rates of both sexual assault experience as well as institutional betrayal. And within that, there were two kinds of institutional betrayal we looked at. One was the, the institutional betrayal that I described, but we also asked questions specifically about betrayal associated with sexual orientation. We found higher rates for both of these. Um, and um, higher negative symptoms, not surprisingly. Both well, this finding and the one I just told you about before, to me, really point to the responsibility of institutions of higher education, and probably this is going to be the case also for K-12, but these institutions, their responsibility not only to prevent sexual assault, but also how they respond, because it is going to potentially directly impact the well-being of the individuals in, their, in the institution. Um, another study that um, has been recently co um, completed, also with Carly Smith, um, looked at institutional betrayal and its impact on physical health problems. And again, we see um, a similar pattern as with mental health problems. And then looked also at um, the relationship between levels of dissociation and whether individuals are staying in the institutions in which they experience betrayal. And I think this is a particularly important result because this is pointing in the direction of the role of betrayal blindness. What we're seeing is more, is more a dissociation for individuals who are staying in their institutions where they encounter institutional betrayal. And we can't at this point um, say what the causal direction is but it certainly looks like some sort of betrayal blindness occurring here. We have um, been recently asked by policymakers and others um, from this research, and there are other studies that I uh, um, can get to in the question period if you want to know more, but we've been asked what does this suggest to us for what institutions can do? Um, and one of the things that we um, have recommended is that and institutions educate themselves and the people with power in the institutions about the potential to cause serious harm through institutional betrayal. That this is a direct, potentially harmful thing. It's a behavior people need to be accountable for. Um, and also, um, to help, uh, it turns out there are lots of laws that are relevant um, to protecting students in higher education, for instance, often um, laws that are not being complied with, although recently this has become um, a very, very sort of high visibility issue, but it's still the case that even the laws that are there, which themselves are not sufficient, but still are a step in the right direction, they're not being complied with. So help educating um, institutions is very important. If you are situated yourself in an institution of higher education, you may well have been recently exposed to some sort of mandatory training on these very issues. 
Um, this is happening all over the country. One of the alarming things we have found in a study I haven't presented here is that um, that mandatory training that's largely occurring is not doing any good. Um, and that's because it's been farmed out to insurance companies, it's risk management, it's not education. At least that's why I think it's not doing any good. Um, institutions need to be grappling with this issue as a, you know, the perf using the power of education, getting people to engage with the topic and own it and think about it. Another um, line of research that we've been looking at is um, the role of institutional emails that get sent out to students. There are these things called crime alerts. We found out that many of them are deeply problematic and probably actually increasing um, people's misunderstanding of sexual assault, feeding into rapeness, and also leading to a kind of institutional betrayal. Um, and, you know, there's a need for a huge amount more research um, and funding for that research. Institutions also need to be conducting self-study, and one of the nice things about our institutional betrayal um, questionnaire is it can be easily rephrased to a self-study question from the standpoint of institutions. Um, and, you know, I know some of you probably are in very explicit institutions, others of you may be in more informal institutions, but in all these contexts there can be the opportunity for self-study regarding um, whether the institution is contributing to institutional betrayal in this way. Um, the final though, last point I want to make is that we can do a much better job of appreciating and cherishing the whistleblower. One of the things that's been very clear in watching what's happened in cases like Penn State and the military and college campuses across this country is that those who dare to question the power structure are often really punished for doing so. Um, and this is not ultimately in the interest of the institution in the long run. It is in the short run, perhaps, but not the long run. Um, so cherishing the whistleblower as helping the institution, much as a software company does when they hire somebody to find bugs in software, will probably go a long way towards institutions correcting this problematic direction they've been on. And uh, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. And I would love your questions.